Chimpanzee Experts webinar. So we really hope that you've enjoyed our series of short chimpanzee videos and that it's given you a taste of how amazing chimpanzees really are, but also how important local researchers are for building this understanding of chimpanzees and also the threats that they're facing across tropical Africa. So you can still access these videos on the Facebook page and through YouTube, so please share these widely with all your friends and family. So after um, you've watched and enjoyed these videos, we really wanted to give you the opportunity to ask us any questions you might have. And I speak for the whole panel when I say that no question is too silly or too small. And we especially want to hear from all you young budding scientists and anyone who has a real fascination for chimpanzees. Uh, Hello everyone. Um, we think that uh, it's really fitting today that uh, we have uh, all female, all women panel today. I hope you agree with me. Uh, 60 years ago, uh, Jane Goodall was one of three women along with uh, Diane Fossey and Virut Kaldikas that went off to study great apes, so uh, chimpanzees, orangutans, and gorillas in their natural habitat uh, that was uh, fostered uh, at the time by Louis Leakey, who was a paleoanthropologist. Uh, and since then, chimpanzee research has really attracted women scientists wanting to better understand our chimpanzee and cousins. We have, uh, we can say that primatology is uh, uh, very dominated by female researchers, mm -hmm. um, or at least that has a lot of female researchers interested in this discipline. Um, so without further ado, I think it would be great now to uh, uh, briefly introduce uh, ourselves and our chimpanzee work, and then we can crack on with answering all your questions. Uh, so I guess it makes sense to start with me. I am Susana Carvalho and uh, uh, I am a primatologist and also an archeologist. So I'm a hybrid. Uh, we can talk about that more later. I have done research on chimpanzees since uh, 2006. So it's now almost 14 years uh, that I have been uh, focusing on stone tool use in wild chimpanzees, both in Guinea, West Africa, and then on also uh, ance human ancestor sites in Kenya, uh, on the other side of Africa, studying human stone tool technology. So I have been focused on both uh, aspects. Um, and I guess that's, that's, that's enough about me. Uh, maybe I will pass it to Ellen Persacola now. Thank you, Susanna. Hi, I'm Helen, uh, Dr. Helen Versacola. I am a postdoc researcher uh, at the University of Exeter. I work with Kim Hawkins here present. Um, I've done research on chimpanzees in Guinea-Bissau now for five years, thanks to Kim. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, my, including my PhD work, which looked at um, how chimpanzees share the landscape with people. Um, specifically, I worked in Canton National Park, which is characterized of, uh, of a landscape of a mosaic with forest patches, um, um, mangroves and savanna. So I was interested to see um, how um, chimpanzees shared this heterogenic landscape with people. Um, yeah, so like my this, they like my the scope of my research is mainly to look at um, chimpanzees and human interactions and to see how we can understand and find ways to um, increase human chimpanzee co coexistence. Thank you. Great, I think it's my turn now. So my name is Alejandra Pascual Garrido. I'm a postdoc fellow at the Primate Models for Behavior Evolution Lab at Oxford University. And I have been studying um, how chimpanzees use plant, plant to make tools to eat insects such as bees and termites. But unlike a lot of primatologists, I don't spend much time following chimpanzees, but I'm more like an archeologist because what I look when I go in a forest is I look for their plant tools. And I try to infer behavior from all these plant tools I am well. I find while I'm walking in the forest that I find all these plant tools. So um, in that sense, I'm quite different from the average primatologist that is just um, following teams uh, all day round. <laughs> Great, my turn next. So I'm Dr. Kimberly Hawkins. Um, you can call me Doc Hawk if it's easier to remember. And I'm a senior lecturer in conservation science at the University of Exeter's Centre for Ecology and Conservation. 
Um, I've been researching chimpanzees for over 20 years now and have visited many different sites in East and West Africa, but most of my research has focused um, at one site called Bosu in Guinea and another Cantonese National Park in Guinea-Bissau. And I think a lot of people don't know that over 80% of chimp chimpanzees in West Africa actually lives outside of officially protected areas, so in national parks. And I'm particularly interested in the way in which chimpanzees are able to modify their behaviors to live near people and how and why people are so tolerant towards them. So we often see contexts where chimpanzees are leaving the forest um, and feeding on oranges and papaya in people's back gardens and people show incredible tolerance to this. So I coordinate the Cantonese Chimpanzee Project and I'm also a member of the IUCN Great Ape Specialist Group and the IUCN human primate interaction group. So maybe I'll be fairly well placed to answer some of your more conservation oriented questions along with Helen. And um, hopefully we have a great balance of questions to keep us all engaged. So looking forward to hearing them. Yeah. So I think we can start with something, a question on, um, can we really tell identify a chimpanzee community just by listing a few known behaviors. As, as chimpanzee experts, we always talk about how each chimpanzee community is unique and different. Um, so maybe let's demonstrate this with um, a little <laughs> quiz style um, exercise. So I can start with one chimpanzee community. We probably should get this one right, Susanna, but- um, okay. This chimpanzee community uses uh, wands, plant wands to fish for algae, and they also use stone tools to crack nuts. Which community am I talking about? I think I can answer that uh, that's definitely the community of chimpanzees that lives in Bosu, Bosu forest. Exactly. So as far as I'm aware, no other chimpanzee community displays these behaviors, right? Uh, yes, yes, no, no, no. I mean, uh, in terms of the combination of algae fishing and uh, using stones to crack nuts, as far as I know, it continues to be a combination that you only see in Bosu. Albeit separately, you mm -hmm. have other communities of chimpanzees doing stone tool use, and also algae fishing has been now reported for other uh, sites in, uh, um, in West Africa, actually. Um, I think it's border north of Guinea. Um, so we see those behaviors in different communities, but that combination mm -hmm. um, and even the uh, entire repertoire of our chimpanzees in Bosu, uh, as in a group of uh, uh, chimpanzees that has or uses up to 22 different tools, uh, mm -hmm. that's a repertoire that is very distinctive from that community. You could, exactly. you could identify chimpanzees by their tool use repertoire, for example, amongst other things, of course. And I mean, I, it's fascinating from a behavioral perspective and um, also asking questions about kind of behaviors in mm -hmm. our, um, in, uh, our closest living relatives, but also um, it's becoming increasingly apparent that understanding this, these differences in behaviors um, are really important for conservation because we want to be able to conserve this cultural variation, don't we? And so if we lose even just one chimpanzee community, we're, we're potentially risking losing all this valuable information about chimpanzee culture. Absolutely, absolutely. It's something that uh, I think several of us have been uh, talking about for a few years, but now became more preeminent with colleagues mm -hmm. actually publishing um, this behavioral variation across sites and the decline uh, mm -hmm. in, that, in, in many of those behaviors. Um, and, uh, and not only we are at risk of losing those traditions uh, that are very unique, like I was saying, to each community, but we are also at risk of losing uh, all the material culture that goes along with it. So in very archaeological terms, by now, we should have a bunch of museums um, across the world displaying these very uh, unique sets of material culture um, from different communities of chimpanzees, uh, and that work hasn't been done yet. Uh, and uh, in some cases, maybe if we don't act quickly, we will lose our opportunity to mm. collect those tools, study them, museum, showing them to the next generations, uh, because yeah. not everyone can go to the forest and not everyone can see these individuals in the wild. It's very important that we show everything we can about them um, yeah. outside also their, their natural environment. 
So it looks like we may have some questions. Yeah, I might just ask one about one other um, particular chimpanzee community just to see yes. if um, we're not being biased to the sites we work. <laughs> <laughs> okay, this particular chimpanzee community shares incredibly large jackfruits, mm -hmm. and they also use stick tools to dig for honey underground. Which community is it? Anyone? Okay. Our collaborator, um, our collaborator on this. Okay. Lindy. <laughs> Yes, this is Bulindi in Uganda, isn't it? Certainly Bulindi in Uganda, yes. So mm -hmm. um, again, a very unique combination. This is a community that live in a human impacted environment. So they have access to these cultivated jackfruits. And so you, you see them, it's a wonderful observation. You can see them sharing, sitting down, calmly sharing these um, large fruits. So mm -hmm. again, I think just to re-emphasize the point, um, it's not just chimpanzees in these so-called pristine landscapes that show these incredibly um, unique behaviors. It's also chimpanzees in human impacted environments. So- um, Absolutely. I have, a, I have a, a, also a question for this quiz. See if anyone knows. Which, com <laughs> which community of chimpanzees, uh, in which community of chimpanzees, sometimes individuals that are using tools to termite fish, split the tool and give half of the tool to another individual. Um, I think I can answer that question. That's in Walago. So there that is very interesting because the mothers, um, it's very important when you are termite fishing to learn from your mom and that you get access to the tools that your mom is doing. So you start to get an idea how the tool needs to look to be a good tool for termite fishing. So in Walago, uh, the mothers are splitting the, the tool and they give half of it to their daughters or sons. So the uh, daughters of science will have the opportunity to start to practice like we do when we are little boys and girls and mom or dad gives us a fork or a knife and we have to start getting familiar to this fork, mm. how we gonna handle it. So it's exactly the same. So the mom in this case is a very good mom because she's uh, willing to give half of her tool to the daughter or the son. So he or she has the opportunity to start practicing. So they, they learn from each other and mom, as we humans, have a very important role in uh, teaching and uh, for the kids to learn. So we all need a good mom that we can learn from. Wonderful. Fantastic. Um, let's go to another question that um, someone has asked. Um, so Charlotte Taylor has asked, besides deforestation, what would you say the biggest threat to chimpanzees is? That's a big one. Um, mm -hmm. so yeah, we've seen, there's like more and more evidence. I think I can answer that, but let's make this. Yeah, <laughs> um, yeah, they were seeing more and more evidence now that, um, like habitat loss per se doesn't necessarily like wipe out the chimpanzees that are able to adapt to certain human landscapes, especially when we have these, um, mosaics of rural villages and, uh, agriculture where they can switch um, their like socio-ecological behavior and start using some of these new resources. Um, so I would say like their long-term um, like survival in this type of landscape is more to do with people and the, whether like there is chimpanzee hunting or not and whether there's some sort of like indirect threat um, that can potentially be very harmful for the chimpanzees such as diseases for example um, but I think I would say like in a lot of the the range for example in West Africa and Central Africa hunting is a big, is a big yeah threat. but it's it's not happening everywhere like for example where where we work it's mm -hmm. a bit different um, so the place where Helen and I work, Canton Edge National Park, it's over a thousand square kilometers um, and it's, it's over 20,000 people within the national park and we see probably the largest chimpanzee population in the country. Um, but chimpanzees do need forests to live, there's no question about that. So if you have um, a practice where all trees are cut down in an area, chimpanzees can't live in that landscape. It's very, very different. But if we look, for example, in Uganda, um, the Albertine Rift, we see many chimpanzee communities hanging on, even though they don't have much forest. And that is because people do not traditionally kill and eat these chimpanzees. So that allows them to persist in this type of landscape. 
One problem that you do have in this type of landscape is that um, uh, chimpanzees are quite large, they can be quite scary, and they can be aggressive. So we do have problems of chimpanzees attacking people, um, people retaliating and killing chimpanzees. And that's probably one of the largest threats in these types of landscapes. But I would like to emphasize that different chimpanzee populations are facing many, many different threats. Um, so again, like we were saying with chimpanzee behavior and culture, um, it can be quite difficult to generalize. Um, so for example, chimpanzees aren't traditionally eaten in Guinea-Bissau, but they might be in some Central African countries. So again, you need to look at particular context um, in that country and even at that site um, to really get a good understanding mm. of the main threats. Mm. Absolutely. Yes. What, what about uh, crop raiding? Do the chimpanzees like to go to people's land and eat their crops? Is that a problem? <laughs> Yeah, so again, um, many of the sites that I work in, I'm in, quite interested in these sites where chimpanzees live very closely to people. And chimpanzees mostly eat ripe fruits and local and people, local communities grow ripe fruits in their gardens. So mangoes, papaya, oranges. Um, it, again, it's quite interesting. It depends, the, whether it's a problem or not, depends on the crop itself and the value, the economic value of that crop. So what we see in Cantonage is that oranges are a real problem, but um, cashew fruit isn't because people want the economically valuable nut. They don't care about the fruit. So again, it's, it's really difficult to generalize um, whether chimpanzee crop foraging is a problem or not. Do you have anything to add to that, Helen? No, I think I completely agree. And I think it, it's, it changes as well, like over time, um, depending on like um, how like the polit social political situation um, changes and like the types of crops that are like come to replace other crops. And so like, it's an ever changing process. And that's why like, it's so important to really like work with local people to understand the situation from their point of view rather than just the chimpanzee point of view. Mm -hmm. um, how is it in Bossa? It's probably similar in Bossa. <laughs> running like chimpanzees running away with papayas and things like that. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, that's what got us first interested, wasn't it, um, Susanna? And we've, and we've been able to watch how chimpanzees are modifying their behavior and foraging for papayas, for example, to answer really interesting evolutionary questions. For example, Susanna wrote a paper on the evolution of bipedality and why chimpanzees are walking on two legs. And um, yeah, I don't know if you wanted to say a little bit more about these types of behaviors, Susanna. I can, I can. Uh, I mean, one of the, one of, of course, one of the things that are very interested, everything is interesting about chimpanzees, but obviously uh, they can definitely shed some light into uh, behaviors that uh, do not fossilize and that we are trying to understand how they evolved in our own uh, past of humans. Uh, bipedalism or walking on two uh, legs, walking on two limbs, uh, it's something that really defines us, defines our whole lineage. So it means us and all our uh, ancestors that are not alive anymore. Um, that along with our very small teeth overall and small mm. canines, uh, that's about the two uh, characteristics that you can actually pinpoint um, across the whole hominin uh, lineage. Um, and, uh, and so it's very interesting for me, and I think for a lot of us, to try to look at uh, our closest living uh, relatives in this case to understand why an ape like a chimpanzee um, walks sometimes bipedally when, you know, it's a chimpanzee is obviously not a bipedal creature, most of the time walks on four legs, on the, or using the four limbs. Uh, but sometimes you can see them using bipedal locomotion. So going around on two legs, like in this case that Kim mm. uh, uh, was uh, talking about when they go to the village and they want to get the papayas from these trees that are very close to the houses of, 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 of humans. Um, and they basically are trying to carry as much as they can at once, right? So mm. they uh, use their mouth to storage a papaya and their arms and therefore it becomes mandatory to uh, walk on uh, two legs until they get to the safety of the forest. Um, we also mm -hmm. saw the same uh, analogous behavior uh, when chimpanzees are uh, doing nut cracking, so using stone tools to access to, to, to nuts, uh, which are a very, very caloric and important uh, resource for them. And when they want to uh, basically uh, get 
as many nuts as they can and move them to a place where other individuals, other chimpanzees cannot go to, they also tend to uh, walk bipedally. And uh, mm -hmm. we did one very interesting study where we discovered that uh, when you do walk bipedally, you can carry several times more items than we, when you don't walk bipedally in that particular mm -hmm. scenario. Uh, and I think we, we came uh, uh, across some interesting uh, hypotheses that have been uh, put forward for human evolution in terms of maybe uh, when we became bipedal, we humans, uh, it had something to do with uh, changes, climatic changes that were quite different from the ones we are living today, but have some similarities in the sense that things were, the climate was changing quite quickly or quite dramatically. Uh, and so resources was also changing. The, the, the foods you knew were changing, the items you are used to uh, resource to are changing. Um, and so individuals that variability of, of, uh, of uh, climate and of resources, uh, and therefore the value of the food that you want to access for you suddenly increases. And all of mm -hmm. that maybe uh, could link to you walking more frequently in bipedal locomotion. Basically, uh, we did not invent the wheel. This is some. This is this is called in in science the carrying hypothesis. Somebody called Hughes in the sixties published a paper uh, about this, actually uh, based on observations of Japanese macaques uh, uh, in in Japan, um, uh, carrying also items that were that are given to them that are provisioned to them, um, and uh, and it was a good revisiting of this carrying hypothesis. Yeah. Uh, there are many many hypotheses out there to explain why we. Uh, became these very strange bipedal primates. We and this is why chimpanzees are so interesting, isn't it? We, yeah. we can ask a question, kind of comparative psychology, animal behavior, behavioral Absolutely. ecology, and answer these really interesting uh, questions that help us better understand ourselves. Absolutely. And so I think that touches upon the next question that's here. Um, Katie Oliver has asked, why did you decide to study chimpanzees? And maybe it's best to start with our uh, Helen, our uh, youngest person. Yes. By accident. <laughs> 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 no, I, I always like I was always fascinated by chimpanzees for the same reasons um, that you just um, um, talked about, um, like how close, how, how close we are to them, and how you know how we can compare like a lot of our behaviors um, to our human evolution, but. Um, I mean, even for my post, uh, for my PhD, I, I was interested in all primates. Um, so like the research question was more like a general like primate community. And then I think like once, not too long after I set foot into Canton National, National Park and everyone was talking about chimpanzees, local people were like, that the chimpanzees were such a like strongly, kind of like, such a strong presence, presence in, in, in the sites that, uh, I mean, like it was, I guess, it, it's it's local people's fault. I would like answer. Uh, <laughs> Brilliant. <laughs> um, <yeah. laughs> Alejandra. Yes, it's uh, very similar to Helen's experience. It's by kind of accident. Um, I am a biologist by trained, but then I became a primatologist. So I studied studying different primates in the Amazons, then in Africa, and then I was studying baboons and the, in a site in Nigeria where I did my PhD mm. and always the chimpanzees were around and people were talking oh today we saw the chimpanzees or we heard them and I was with the baboons which are amazing and I love baboons and I asked very interesting uh, but this kind of thing oh you know these uh, people were getting so excited when you heard chimpanzees and and that kind of get me more and more excited about <laughs> chimpanzees and chimpanzees and baboons are great but how, why people get so much excited about chimpanzees and then I, I ended up doing my PhD in chimpanzees. Um, so it's kind of an accident, but the, the situation took mm. me there. Um, there. People react really different with chimpanzees and other primates simply yeah. probably because they are our closest living relatives. So of mm. course people are more interested in, in them. Um, so yeah, it's kind of an uh, accident and um, yeah. And I mean, Helen and Alejandro, did you find that local people were talking about kind of morphological similarities, so physical similarities, as well as behavioral similarities? So they look after their young, they teach them, they look like us, they can walk bipedally. Is that one of the things you notice people saying? 
Yeah, definitely uh, people with chimpanzees, local people have their own stories and um, about like sometimes the, the little humans of the forest and uh, mm -hmm. why they're so similar to us. While with baboons and all the other primates, it doesn't, they, they don't mm -hmm. talk like that. So there is, uh, in Africa, even oh. with local people, they, they, they react very different with chimps. And even the local field assistants, when you are close to chimps, they get really excited. Oh, the chimps are here, they're close. Yeah, it's yeah, good. fascinating. How about you, Susanna? Um, this is, these are all accidental primatologists <laughs> here. Um, so I, I uh, did my first training as an archaeologist. So I come from originally from an archaeological background and a lot of interest in, in the origins of technology and all of that. And at some point, um, I was interested, of course, always in human evolution at some point during my human evolution um, training in a, in a master, I came across primatology uh, for the first time that was taught by uh, Claudia Sosa, um, uh, who we all miss a lot. Uh, and uh, with Claudia, I, for the first time, I you know, learned about primates and completely fell in love by uh, chimpanzees and by non-human primates in general and mm -hmm. I really saw that as a, um, a wonderful way to finally look at behavior instead of just looking at objects and imagining behavior behind it. Mm -hmm. uh, it seemed like something really uh, interesting to pursue and, um, and I think it was a mixture of these two things uh, to be I developed really a passion and fascination by the chimpanzees. And I think the, the idea of going to Bosu, going to West Africa and doing some primate archeology span uh, work was more of an excuse at the, mo at, at the time to, to convince uh, people to let me go study chimpanzees when my background was not uh, one of a biologist. So uh, it, it, it did work out luckily. Um, and we're all but, very lucky that you did. <laughs> thank you. But I also wanted to make the point, I think it's it's true for all of us, regardless of where we come from, that um, uh, that I don't think anyone can work with chimpanzees um, in the wild uh, without becoming, to some extent, a conservationist or becoming, to some mm -hmm. extent, developing an interest in mm -hmm. uh, conservation. Uh, so... So that's all there, you know. Uh, but yeah. but this is how this is how the 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 road developed to study chimpanzees in in West Africa. Yeah. So I'll answer the question myself. So I'm originally from Bournemouth, the same place as Jane Goodall. So I think from a young age, I was quite heavily exposed to a lot of the amazing things that she did. And um, so I went on, like many students, to do the A levels, doing biology, and then chose a university with a really um, strong group of primatologists. So I went to Liverpool. I did my undergraduate dissertation with Robin Dunbar, who encouraged me to go and look at chimpanzees in Chester Zoo. And from then on, I, I was just hooked and went to Bodongo Forest to do a project and then did my PhD in Bosu. And then most of my research now is on Cantonese. So I guess I'm probably the only one that followed that more traditional um, line of getting into chimpanzee research. But I would say for anyone who really is keen to pursue a career in um, chimpanzee research and conservation. If you're coming at it from an academic point of view, choosing universities that do already have a presence of um, researchers who study chimps is always gonna be a bonus because it will give you easier access to um, various chimpanzee sites. Um, but you can also get um, volunteer experience, for example, in Monkey World in Dorset, where um, they rescue um, pet chimpanzees from across Europe and um, volunteering your services to um, any of these different sanctuaries or different non-government organizations, NGOs, um, to assist in the conservation of chimpanzees. So um, you don't have to, of course, follow that um, standard academic route. There are many different routes to uh, studying and conserving wild chimpanzees. So, right. Next question, what is the scariest or funniest moment you've had with wild chimpanzees? Alejandro, you're smiling. Yes, well, I, I have uh, quite a few, but I'm gonna say uh, one that was really a good experience. So I was in Gombe studying termite fishing and um, I was really looking to the teams, how they were using these tools and uh, it's fascinating. It, it looks so easy, but it's actually, you, it's a whole skill. Um, so I, 
I was I was feeling, you know, when you have that feeling that there some eyes are looking at you very, very strongly. And my feel assistant was in front of me. So I'm saying, <laughs> how can this be? What is there another person here that is looking at me so so strongly? I could feel these eyes. So I turn around. And this was this male who later became the alpha male of Gombe, in the latest, <laughs> looking at me, studying me, like I was studying these chimpanzees. So that day I learned two things. First of all, chimpanzees are very curious about us, very. And you chimpanzees always see you before you see them. Definitely. <laughs> and the, the funniest thing is, oh my, he was looking so straight at me when I turned back that I thought this is going to be a great shot. So I take my camera slowly to take a, a good shot of his face. And the moment I take my camera, he turned his back. He didn't want me to take that picture. So he turned the back on me and said, like, there's not going to be a picture of me. So that was really a very uh, enlightening moment and uh, saying, this, you know, it's, it's amazing how he was studying me all this time. And I never realized, I never realized it was mm -hmm. this. So that was a great moment for me. Excellent. Helen, what about you? <laughs> well, it's, it's a bit different for me because we don't study habituated chimpanzees. So like when, mm -hmm. when we get close to one another, it's by surprise. It's like an accident, right? So like sometimes we even just cycle through and like all of a sudden you just hear something and it's like right like in like two meters from you or like equal way like you're in the forest or even like in agricultural areas and you hear them like their presence really close to you. But it's never been like that close that we're like, okay, it's like mm -hmm. very, very, it, I put myself in a dangerous situation or anything. Um, but like, I think like, more more for us because we use camera traps it was more like an adventure to when we were setting up camera traps up to the trees um so like the we would use climbing equipment to set to like climb the trees safely otherwise um it could be a bit dangerous for us um so we would go up like about 10 15 meters and then set up a camera to aim to target our primates which was exciting um and there was this one time that we were up there and quickly realized that we, the tree was covered in army ants. But we realized at the, at the same time as, getting, uh, as we were being bitten by them. So we realized they were inside our clothes as well. And we were up there 15 meters from the ground, thanking the gods that we had the equipment with us, powering through, um, set up the camera eventually, and then, yeah, cried a bit. Joys of working in tropical forests. <laughs> That's classic field work, That's yeah. Classic <laughs> field work, yeah. So, Susanna. Me, uh, okay. You must um, have loads. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, I decided that today we should be very honest here and just <laughs> and not hide our weaknesses and, and strengths. So I guess I, I think my scariest moment was um, the first, probably one of the first days I was following the chimpanzees in the forest. Um, like I said, my background was, was not in, in, in this area. So I, it was really my first, first ever experience with non-human primates anywhere. Um, and having seen one of the most impressive displays of Yoro, the, this Yoro mm. was our alpha male at the time. Uh, and he was not one of the most uh, belliger belligerent and aggressive alpha males, but uh, he could, you know, he could be very, very scary when he was displaying. And this was my first time ever to um, to see a display. And Yoro was running around bipedally, all the the hair up and running and stopping. I don't know, maybe you know, fifty centimeters from me, um, uh, and doing this repeatedly while jumping up and down the trees, uh, screaming and vocalizing, breaking branches. Uh, in doing things like that, and uh, uh, I was I was very terrified in that moment. It was my yeah. first time to see a full-on <laughs> chimpanzee display uh, mm. in the forest, and I remember I thank my field assistants that uh, 
allowed me not to start running in the forest mm -hmm. uh, which the worst thing you can do isn't would it be the, would be the worst yeah. thing i could do but probably if they wouldn't uh, be there that's maybe what i would have done so that was yeah. that was quite scary uh, and of course then you you get used to it and you uh, you learn that it's not as as scary as it seems the first time you look at it mm -hmm. the funniest moment probably was the day when play play was uh, one of the um, our, our most iconic chimpanzees in Bosu, he, 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 he was a, comp a true terrorist. Um, and, 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 and he was an individual that was always, always finding trouble for himself and for mm -hmm. the others. And one day going back to the, the station from work, Play was literally behind a tree with a huge branch waiting for me and the field assistant to pass and to try to hit us ah. in, in the head or whatever it was uh, with his uh, with his weapon, uh, and this was probably one of the uh, the funniest things that uh, I have uh, experienced with uh, with yeah, yeah, yeah. No, he 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 missed again. Uh, 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 I think it was Boniface, the field assistant, saved my life several times. So mm -hmm. uh, he didn't get me, but it was extremely funny the, the whole situation um play was just hilarious in in many ways i mean on that same note i think my scariest moment was again with euro um mm. displaying above me and i mean for everyone out there we deliberately stay a certain distance away over seven meters away from chimpanzees because then um we try not to interfere with their natural behavior and it reduces the risk of spreading any diseases so we deliberately stay quite far away from them. Anyway, Euro was displaying above me in a tree and he just flew out of that tree. And luckily uh, my field assistant Boniface pushed my face down and Euro just jumped off my head. Oh my God. Um, so again, I probably, Great. Thanks, I'm not sure about my life, but at least my nose is having an unbroken nose is thanks to Boniface in, in that particular moment. Um, but again, I mean, it highlights, it's probably not the kind of thing we write in our risk assessments, is it? But it does highlight some of the risks of working um, in these uh, particular, with these particular communities. Um, but yeah, they get used to you, you get used to them. Um, but again, I think we're starting to realize that some of the uh, positive things about habituating chimpanzees um, can also be quite negative. Yes. So again, in Canton Edge, we've decided not to habituate the chimpanzees for that reason. We don't want them to get used to us because we don't want them to lose their fear of people. Um, and again, I think having a bit of experience with different chimpanzee communities allows you to kind of develop your own ways that you think um, are right for conducting chimpanzee research. Um, so oh, absolutely. Yeah. On that note, Kim, or maybe Helen, uh, can you tell us a little bit about how do you get uh, chimps habituated to humans? Does that take many years? What is the habituation? Why can we see chimpanzees in the wild that they are not scared about us? And about why maybe in other sites we go and they run away from us? Maybe mm -hmm. we want to learn, we want to know a little bit more about that. Go on, Helen. So, I mean, I, I only have experience in Canton. Eh? Well, I guess I have some experience in, in Uganda, but uh, in Canton as the chimps, don't necessarily are not super super scared of you um they won't like run away completely but they want a safe distance from you so like if you encounter by accident the chimpanzees and they're like four meters from you or like they it's already too too close for them um seven meters is the same ten meters is the same so they like it's easy to see them and observe them but it will be from quite like a long distance maybe let's say like 300 meters or so. Yeah. Yeah. And we have never tried to habituate these chimpanzees, have we, Helen? No. But because they're not hunted by local people, they're not as scared of local people, say, as certain communities um, in other areas where people do engage in um, hunting and poaching. So um, we're quite lucky in that fact. I mean, I've sat in Canton Edge Forest with completely unhabituated chimpanzees. Um, they're about 15 meters away, but they've sat there quite happily for three hours. And this would be absolutely unheard of when chimpanzee communities that are hunted. Um, so we're quite lucky in that respect. So chimpanzees, some of the more famous habituated chimpanzee communities that we know of, um, they've taken a long time to, they take a long time to habituate. So in the early days, people would provision them. 
and with bananas and other foods to get them to bring them closer to people. But we now know that is not a good practice that increases um, aggression between chimpanzees and also can potentially um, make chimpanzees more aggressive to you. And that's the same with a lot of different animal species. So that's something we do not do anymore. Um, so really habituation takes a very long time. You have to be incredibly patient. You have to be incredibly calm and quiet. And over time, chimpanzees, certain individuals become more used to you and then normally the um, bolder males, to be honest, and then the females over time will also become more habituated towards you. And then that allows you to follow them and observe their behaviors um, in close proximity. So was Jane Goodall the first person to do this in the forest? And how, how did she have this idea or does she, do, how do, do you know about that? So I'm sure local people have in Africa reserved chimpanzees for thousands and thousands of years. Um, well, if we talk about Westerners, yeah, I think Jane Goodall was certainly one of the first. I know in West Africa, there were people around the same time, um, Adrian Cortland and others who were going and observing um, chimpanzees in West Africa. But certainly Jane Goodall, I mean, she is the iconic figure, the first person certainly to observe, Westerner to observe tool use um, in wild chimpanzees. But I mean, you've worked uh, a lot longer in Gombe than I have, so you're probably much better placed to answer that question than me. Yes, well, like you say, she also used provisioning by giving bananas, and that turned out to be a big problem because then mm. all the chimpanzees will come and the baboons. And so it turned out not to be such a good idea. So then she stopped. But like you say, provisioning was at, at those times was the, the way they would do it in Mahale, where I also work. They did the same, they started provisioning the chimps and that's why the way they, the chimps started to get closer to, to the humans and habituation I think is a daily thing that they need mm -hmm. to see the humans every day to get used to it. So it's a, you have to have a lot of patience and um, yes, it's a, it's a, they have to see the humans every day or very often. Yeah. The moment they stop seeing humans, they start to get uh, scared. Mm -hmm. So yes, but provisioning, like you said before, is not, not really the way to do it. Definitely not a I good think, thing. I think it is uh, important maybe for the audience to say that, you know, to give, a, to give a, a perspective on things, to say that, well, these were the, like Kim was saying, actually, I mean, Jane Goodall is the first uh, looking at Westerners, Mm -hmm. uh, but but I would say, I don't know who is hearing us out there, but I'm going to go on a limb here and say that there is quite some controversy about uh, uh, the Japanese teams, the Japanese colleagues' presence in Africa versus non-Japanese. Um, uh, as as uh, many of us know, uh, the, the, the Japanese scientists have been absolutely pioneers in many fields uh, of many fields, many different studies of primatology in the wild and in their own country. Um, and uh, I believe uh, Mahale started officially a little later than Gombe, uh, mm -hmm. but there was there was there was a big barrier in terms of language, in terms of publishing in English and all of this. Uh, so let's say officially it was Gombe, but we know that by 1,500 something there are documents uh, in Portugal, where I am originally from, uh, from the, the 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 time where you had missionaries in Africa talking about chimpanzees and to use in chimpanzees. Mm -hmm. Those are the first original reports in written, written. Yeah. obviously the local communities uh, know about these uh, animals for a long time and 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 and, I'd, and, and have them as their um, in the case of Bosu. Uh, as their totems and as, as their ancestors. Um, and in terms of habituation, maybe just a word to say that things have changed dramatically. I mean, the colleagues were provisioning uh, these animals because at the time we thought uh, that was okay, basically. We, did, we didn't have uh, the, the understanding that that could change behavior or lead to competition or aggression. As soon as researchers understood that, it, they stopped. Um, mm. And the habituation, like Kim was saying very well, right now is not something that is considered lightly. I don't think there are colleagues starting now habituation as, as people did it in the past, because we know mm -hmm. that it's dangerous for chimpanzees in many ways, not only a, 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 in terms of health, which is something, you know, very a very good topic to talk about given the pandemic we are living, but uh, also uh, because they, they lose fear of humans and therefore they are less likely to fly away from uh, from from uh, to run away from uh, uh, poachers, etc. So mm -hmm. in many places, people are ap applying a combination of methods to get data that does not include 
the old style 12 hours following chimpanzees in the forest. Yeah, exactly. Right, so I'm going to move on to another question that Claire Morsley has just asked us. So thank you for an interesting discussion. I wondered if there are chimpanzee behavior is there a chimpanzee behavioral research that currently isn't being undertaken, which the panel feels should be. Hmm. Give you all a second to digest the question and come up with some uh, mm. I, can, I, I can start, but I don't want to monopolize this. I can start because one is something that I think Kim and I have been talking for quite a while. I think uh, somebody um, needs to, um, you know, there is a lot of scope right now uh, to look at something that is um, said. Uh, it's a sad event, but it's very important to um, document, mm. which is the loss of traditions across uh, uh, chimpanzee sites, but on a, on a more, um, you know, lift spirit uh, 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 approach, uh, there is a lot of scope to look at novel behaviors emerging from these adaptations uh, mm -hmm. to, to these changing habitats, right? Where chimpanzees are brilliant and excellent in, in adapting and quickly solving problems and quickly finding ways of uh, coping with the, the change of their habitat. And I think very few people are still looking at that with a positive look. People still, mm -hmm. uh, or I think that is still that, that idea, that's what uh, Kim uh, published in, that, in a paper called Apes in the Anthropocene, um, that uh, people ha still think about this idea of studying chimpanzees in pristine habitats versus uh, the poor researchers that are working in, 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 in areas that are not real habitats. And uh, I think it's time to drop that. There are, no, there are almost no pristine areas left. And uh, there are very interesting behaviors emerging in these in this, uh, changing environments that uh, mm -hmm. I think people haven't looked at um, properly. So I'll just add um, a point to that. Uh, again, I think... Um, the coronavirus pandemic has highlighted how we really need a better understanding of how emerging infectious diseases are impacting chimpanzees and chimpanzee behavior. So whether do, do infectious diseases impact uh, chimpanzee social dynamics, so how they mix with other members of their group, and um, does do they impact uh, their feeding? And so I think um, there's going to become a lot more, there's a lot more research uh, currently undergoing um, in this in this particular domain. What we find is most research actually comes out of one site um, in West Africa, so Thai in mm. Cote d'Ivoire. And um, they've been monitoring chimpanzees for over 20, some communities for 20 years, up to 40 years. And so they have this long-term data on chimpanzee health. And that would be amazing if we had that type of data from um, other chimpanzee sites. And we're trying, we're trying to start now in Cantonage by um, ongoing health and behavioral monitoring programs. But um, that would be something that would be wonderful if it could be conducted um, across different sites in uh, tropical Africa. Any other points you'd like to add to this, Alejandro or Helen? I have to think a little bit more about this. <laughs> it takes us a long time Maybe. to generate new research Maybe. ideas, Claire, so that's one. Uh, absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. Are we are going to be giving them away here and then. Uh, but, uh, but to add to what Kim is saying also in, 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 in terms of collaboration, right? Because I think what, uh, what this question also raises that is interesting is that we are now at the... So there was a stage where the research started with chimpanzees in Africa and uh, every site was try to, trying to collect data on their own community of chimpanzees. Um, and now 50 years later or 60 years later, we are at the stage where actually if there is collaborative efforts, people can start looking at variation of behavior in a lot more detail. And I'm not just talking about camera trap data, but actually putting together data that has been collected uh, using all sorts of methods to look at behavioral variation, which is something that we still don't understand enough in, uh, in, in, in chimpanzees. Uh, mm -hmm. We know it's there, but we don't know the extent of it. We don't know, some people talk about uh, diverse cultures, stable cultures across time and knowing, um, which maybe it's another point of interest to discuss, but knowing how chimpanzees uh, have such long lives uh, that mm -hmm. we know now before people said chimpanzees would live until they are 50. Now individuals are still there and we know individuals can live much longer than that. Uh, it's now about uh, time that we have enough information from some sites that uh, in combination could actually uh, give a much better understanding of uh, mm -hmm. chimpanzees as a whole because there is huge variation and it, 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 
what I felt while uh, studying Bosu was that you really don't know enough about chimpanzees by studying one population of chimpanzees, like you wouldn't if, yeah. you, if you are doing humans, right? I mean, it, you, you do need to have that uh, mm. understanding of uh, other populations. And I mean, it, it's not specifically about chimpanzee behavioral research, but I, I do think we need to um, look beyond these very traditional conservation methods that we're all used to hearing about. Um, and to start and start to think about how we can combine um, biodiversity conservation with human development and human improving human health. Um, because a lot of the places we work, people are living in poverty. So they, um, they people earn less than $2 a day. Um, mm -hmm. So we really need to start coming up with ways to marry biodiversity conservation and, um, and development. Um, and I think, uh, again, in Cantonese, we're starting to try, we're trying to do that. Um, again, in other sites, um, it's starting to become a more important um, part of our, not just chimpanzee research, but also thinking about um, the local human communities. So Kim, how do, how do you involve the local people? Do you give them jobs or do, do they want to work with chimpanzees and doing research? Are they interested in that? Yeah, I'll let Helen answer that actually. So. <laughs> um, I think like one of, well, I guess like if one of the first thing as scientists that we could do is understand what people know about chimpanzees and what people do already to conserve the chimpanzees because we yeah. always assume that conservation is only from like international or national institutions, but actually like these, there's like human and chimpanzees have interacted for so long, for so many centuries. So conservation was already going on um, through protective beliefs or land use systems. Um, so the way um, local people use the land and resources, and also they share a lot of these resources, right? Um, so in Cantonese, for example, Kim found that like it was 27 fruit, wild yeah. fruits, that were shared, like people were sharing with uh, in the same habitat as the chimpanzees. So people are already protecting these resources and making sure that these resources are still present even in areas mm -hmm. where um, are like are plates with are, are used for agriculture. Um, so understanding that and understanding their perspective, like people's perspective of what it is, how it is to live with chimpanzees, mm -hmm. um, then we can try to come up with solutions that involve local people as decision makers, as planners, um, at different scales, obviously. Um, yeah. But yeah, I think like that's, I think like conservation for me, like the way I see it starts first with local people. Um, and then we learn. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful, thanks Helen. Um, so a question by Hattie Herridge on the topic of diseases. So now we're a bit further down the line of COVID-19. Are we any closer to knowing how this is going to affect different chimpanzee mm. populations? Mm. Yeah. Um, we know that chimpanzees can catch uh, this particular coronavirus, um, but as far as I'm aware, we don't have direct evidence that any chimpanzee population has caught this disease. Um, at least it hasn't been published yet, and I'm not personally aware of it. It's very difficult to have information on um, diseases, infectious diseases in unhabituated populations, unless you start seeing chimpanzees dropping dead. So um, this is one of the benefits of having habituated populations that you can monitor. So you mm -hmm. can start monitoring simple, uh, mm -hmm. symptoms and get particular samples. But well, I don't know, any, do any of the other panel know of any particular? No, I think, I think you're mm -hmm. right that, uh, that, that, that there hasn't been published research on, on this yet, as far as I am aware, like you. I mean, there hasn't been almost published research on humans, let alone in, in non-humans. Yeah, yeah. uh, but but given the um, given the history and the you know the type of of uh, virus, um, we mm. all know that uh, not only chimpanzees huh? today the discussion is chimpanzees, but we know that um, other primates are are very uh, prone to getting and uh, getting very sick from um, from virus from from coronaviruses. Um, and so with that, I think uh, we, we still don't know very much, scientifically speaking, but we know uh, that this is likely to affect chimpanzee populations mm -hmm. um, if we don't take uh, 
a lot of measures and uh, precaution in terms of, uh, for example, stopping field work at the moment. That's something that uh, people have, uh, or some of us have, uh, I was supposed to be in the field now, not with chimpanzees, but with baboons, but, uh, and I'm not. And I hope a lot of colleagues are doing um, the same, uh, exactly because we don't know enough, but we know that uh, it's, it's, it's very possible uh, that this is going to be a huge problem for other, other, other primates beyond humans. And so um, going back to field work, I think, should be after um, taking into consideration additional measures that I think are already in place in a lot of field sites uh, in terms of keeping distances, in terms of disinfection protocols, in, in all of this. Um, yeah. And so and actually, this might be the most risky time. So most yeah. of the world is kind of coming out of lockdown. And so tourism is going to resume, research might resume. So I think now is the critical time, actually. We need to be incredibly careful. And the IUCN have drafted guidelines that mm -hmm. um, different researchers and NGOs need to follow to try and reduce the mm -hmm. um, impact of uh, coronavirus on chimpanzees, other great apes, other wildlife populations in general. But I really think this is the critical time. We should not become complacent and think that it's all okay. Um, and so, um, yeah, I would urge, do not become complacent and we really need to stick to all these um, mitigation measures. Absolutely. I think this is also part of a larger discussion that we are not mm -hmm. going to have time to have here today uh, about all these uh, conversations of decolonizing uh, primatology, decolonizing conservation, and uh, mm -hmm. it, it's, it goes deeply into this issue when we talk yeah. about how to um, continue field work and research in the, the, the countries, the home countries of, pri of these primates um, yeah. um, without um, risking without additional risk, creating additional risks, sorry, to, to other uh, humans and other non-humans. Yeah, mm -hmm. just quickly, I've noticed we've got about another five minutes left. And there's another question which asks, why should I not buy birthday cards um, with chim smiling chimpanzees on them? Uh, we all get them, don't we? People know we study chimps. We get these silly birthday cards with smiling yeah. chimps. Why is this a problem? Well, I can start. <laughs> um, yeah, so these images of chimpanzees smiling or wearing clothes or anything like that, whether it's like birthday cards or t-shirts or things like that, kind of give the idea that chimpanzees are okay as pets, I guess, um, and which is not true. Um, they're wild animals and they're, they're not cats and dogs. Um, so it's very problematic um, for, for chimpanzee in the wild because pet trade is one of, actually one of um, the main threats uh, for wild chimpanzees as well. Um, yeah, well, do you have anything and to And smiling, add? I mean, smiling to us, this is where we have to be very careful when we think about what something means in human language or human gestures um, compared to what it means in chimpanzee language and actually smiling for chimpanzees it's a fear grimace they're really really scared so basically to get that smile you have to scare them so ethically um it's it's incredibly moral morally questionable and so i urge anyone out there who still buys these smiling chimp cards not to do it because it's cruel um often these it's young chimps you'll notice who are cute um and once they get to a certain age where they become aggressive and uh, they're difficult to manage, people just get rid of them. These trainers just get rid of them. And so they often spend their lives in miserable cages. Um, and so, yeah, I think we really, we really need to move beyond this uh, using primates and many other wildlife um, in terms of our entertainment or as pets. Mm -hmm. So um, I think that is an incredibly important thing we could all be doing. Just don't buy the stuff. Absolutely. That goes with films as well for any primates mm -hmm. like green yeah. mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Absolutely. Well, um, if people want to find more about chimpanzees, how, how can they learn more about chimpanzees? Um, do we go, have to tell them to go to websites or find uh, learn from researchers or maybe we can uh, try to think that a little bit? Mm -hmm. uh, I guess it depends um, which people are interested. So if it's students at university, then maybe um, they can get access to various um, research journals. A lot of research journals are open access. Some of the most interesting um, 
research that's out there also gets spread through um, the media. So you can quite often find some quite good coverage of new uh, chimpanzee research through the media. Sometimes you have to take it all with a bit of a pinch of salt, but then you can go away and read the uh, original article, so that's fine. Um, and yeah, Jane Goodall websites uh, do talk a lot about the conservation activities they're doing um, and they target various different age groups. So that's a good place to start. Um, mm -hmm. Yes, yes. There are lots of places to look at um, uh, that are uh, available online. There are some uh, other sites, NGOs, like like you said, Jane Goodall Institute, Ape Alliance, uh, so, so many different websites that are focused on conservation, but also have a lot of information about uh, what is being done in the terrain and, uh, and information about uh, chimpanzees in particular, which is different mm -hmm. from if you want to learn about primatology, obviously. Yeah. yeah. So I've got another question here um, by Ritwik Banerjee. Um, are the exchange of cultural traits between different chimpanzee populations slash communities? So are there are there exchange of different cultural traits between different chimpanzee communities? And do they learn from other chimpanzee communities? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, this is a yes and no question. So in some cases, uh, we have seen um, because as you know, chimpanzees, females, they migrate to one community to the other one. And sometimes they might bring their own um, cultural trait, let's say. So for example, in Gombe, there is uh, evidence that ant fishing from one community spread to the other community because of a female who migrated to that mm. community. So in that case, it, it is likely that this female who went into the new community spread the ant fishing, which is ant fishing is a behavior where chimpanzees use a, a plant tool to fish little ants that live inside uh, the holes of the trees. So in this case, we have an example of a new chimpanzee bringing a new trait to the new community. But sometimes that doesn't happen that way. And the female who migrates to the new community adapts, readapts to mm -hmm. them what they are doing in the new community. I think there's a case in Bosu um, for nut cracking. I think that the, um, so there are cases in, mm. in, in, in certain places where the, the new migrants adapt to the, what they're mm. doing in the new community and other cases. Mm. So uh, mm. it's not so clear. Mm. I don't mm. know. If so just to, I... Yeah, just to talk a little bit about the nut cracking, uh, uh, to say it's a very interesting question, lots of interesting questions today, very interesting question, uh, and uh, a very difficult to answer still also because of the fact that you need to be following mm. the population and then the migrant female and then the new community where, where, where uh, um, it, it, the, the, the female will uh, go to and look at behavior at least in these two places. But we do, and so a lot of what we have is anecdotal or is inference but mm. uh, we have uh, interesting evidence from um, uh, Lydia Lunx uh, in, a, in a publication showing that females, in this case it's Thai uh, in Ivory Coast, where these females that migrated from uh, one population, one, one group to another group, uh, conformed, which means uh, they did nut cracking in a certain way using a certain technique, and they started uh, uh, using the technique of the new group that they went in. So in that case, it's a no to taking something from the, the community where they came from. But in the case of Bosu, uh, another colleague of ours, Dora Biru, has uh, written a, a paper where she proposes that one female that came to Bosu may have brought with her the knowledge and the tradition from the original uh, group about a certain type of food, the, these kula nuts, that she seemed to know uh, from before, while the, the other individuals seem to be very surprised about. So it was proposed that in that case, she would have brought in uh, that knowledge. So I think there is probably quite a lot of variation. And then with the part of the question that says, um, do they learn from other communities? I, I don't think we have enough um, inf information. And I would say that um, learn from each other, yes, learn from other communities, indirectly through this migration of individuals. Yeah. Uh, chimpanzees are quite territorial and I don't think that is enough time uh, actually uh, bonding it without mm -hmm. aggression with other communities to, uh, to, to, to have this transfer yeah. of uh, knowledge. 
So it's in chimpanzee communities, it's young females. Once they reach puberty, they yes. migrate to another community. Yes. Um, so it's these young females that seem to be key in the mm -hmm. transmission of um, new behaviors. Exactly. So and that's we, what, yeah. what, like Susanna said, it's very difficult to study this mm -hmm. because to see the female, that you have to have two communities that you already study. And then you have to follow one of those females coming to the new community. Mm -hmm. And you have to be studying like how that female before she migrated was behaving, let's say in a tool use, for example, aspect. So it's really, really tricky and it's very, very difficult. So this question is not so easy to answer, like Susanna said. Um, but that, that's, yeah, it's a very good Maybe question. It's, it's a good question. As uh, we, we got asked something earlier about new research questions, mm. um, that we could add that to the list, couldn't we? Yes, absolutely. So uh, we have another question from Tamsin Harper. And Tamsin asks, <clears throat> in communities where chimpanzees are living close to humans, do you know how local people feel about chimpanzees in terms of disease transmission? Mm. Oh. Any thoughts on this one? That's, yeah, I, I can start. Um, yes. That's, yeah, that's actually one of part of like our new project to understand a bit more about how pe local people perceive the disease transmission. So like from both ways, I suppose. And we ha only have preliminary, preliminary results so far. And it, people know that there is this, that, tr that diseases can be transmitted. Um, through, for example, indirect links like water and things like that. Um, but we need more research to know this because it's very, it's, it's, you know, like for example, in West Africa during the Ebola outbreak, there were a lot of like awareness campaigns to say, stop doing this or do this or this, that, stop eating bushmeat, mm -hmm. which, you know, and, and culturally bushmeat is a very uh, broad, mm -hmm. um, it has a broad spectrum. It's not mm -hmm. just about the primates. It's not just about a group of animals. Um, so by understanding a bit more how people perceive diseases um, and disease transmissions, we can come up with um, work that is more culturally sensitive, local sensitive, local appropriate. Um, um, like we can like increase, for example, awareness of these potential risks of uh, transmission between humans and animals. Um, so yeah, I don't know if Kim what you want to add anything. So keep keep an eye out on Helen's future publications <laughs> and you'll get a more solid answer. We'll be uh, hopefully be able to answer that question for you. So um thanks ever so much for everyone who's um, watched this webinar and we hope that you've enjoyed it and that we've been able to answer all of your very interesting questions they've really got us thinking um, and if you do suddenly if any more questions pop into your minds then please feel free to um, ask them on the online chat and we'll try and respond to you um, so yeah on behalf of myself and um, Helen Susanna and Alejandra Thanks ever so much for tuning in and we hope to get this opportunity to chat to you again sometime soon. Okay. Thank Bye. you everyone. Bye.